Well, hello everybody. Uh, good evening to you all. Today we're start we're starting the second keynote session of the Brazilian Symposium Synthetic Biology. You guys should remember that these sessions are optional, and we strongly recommend you to attend them because they are brought in some themes uh, that are very important for the synthetic biology mainframe. Again, if you have any doubts, please send them on the chat in either Portuguese or English so that our moderators can, will be, can pass them to the speaker. So today we're welcoming the amazing Dr. Ben J. Novak. Uh, before we begin, we would like to bring you uh, and tell you a little bit about who Ben Novak is. He is the lead scientist of the Revive and Restore Lab, a nonprofit organization with a mission to innovate and foster the adoption of biotechnologies for nature conservation. In this role, he leads the organization's passenger pigeon and Heath Hen, the extinction prog programs, and the Black Footed Ferret Genetic Rescue prog Program with US Fish and Wildlife Service. Through his work and more broadly, Ben pioneers the conceptualization of biotechnology, biotechnological conservations as an emerging global discipline. Ben earned his Master's of Arts and Ecology and, Evolu and Evolution in the University of California, Santa Cruz in 2016. Ben's notable publications are his 2018 review article, De Extinction, published in the journal Genes. And before any further ado, we welcome you, Ben Novak, and the floor is all yours. Hello. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, it is an honor to get to talk about Revive and Restore and our work and how synthetic biology um, and biotech of all forms can help uh, wildlife conservation. Um, for all the students and everybody that might be tuning in, I will actually clarify, I am not a doctor. I do not have a PhD. Um, so while I think everybody should get PhDs, it's definitely not the only path to getting into this field. So I often get asked that a lot. Um, and with no further ado, I will start my presentation and show you guys the work of both Revive and Restore and um, some colleagues of ours that uh, have been doing some amazing work in biotech conservation. All right. So, Revive and Restore is a conservation nonprofit, and we're very unique in the fact that we're one of the only nonprofits in the world that's promoting the use of biotechnologies for conservation, uh, both promoting the adoption and the innovation of these technologies. Um, we have several roles. What we've been doing is we're leading our own projects, uh, and now we are funding projects uh, uh, and coordinating them, bringing scientists and conservationists and the public together um, and building partnerships with organizations around the world. So uh, we host meetings, listservs, uh, uh, all so sorts of things that we're doing. And we're just an office of six people um, spread across the United States at the moment. Um, but now we have projects around the globe. And the thing that we're trying to push um, is this idea of a genetic rescue toolkit. Um, and this is how we like to look at it, that it's a, um, a series of, of categories of tools that can be all be used at different levels to help conservation. And we have uh, some projects either directly leading or funded in every category so far, except with the invasive species. So I won't be able to talk about that tonight. Um, we have our Catalyst Science Fund. This is what's really letting us uh, expand now into these different spaces. There's a lot of information on the slide, but we're basically doing work with trying to get uh, uh, reproductive technologies advanced in birds. Um, we have an entire uh, toolkit now on coral reefs, trying to develop coral, re coral stem cells, new cryopreservation techniques, understanding the genetics of why uh, uh, they bleach and how we can help facilitate their, uh, facilitate their adaptation to stress. Um, there's about 10 coral projects now. We have a project working on uh, elephant endotheliotropic herpes virus, which is a major threat to elephants. Um, and with black-footed ferrets, 
we're not only cloning to bring back diversity, but we're trying to test out different ways of genetic engineering to produce immunity to disease. And we've been funding new modes of potential in vivo gene editing. Uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of things we're going in. We actually have now about 30 projects funded, and I can only go into a few of them tonight, but definitely get on our website. Um, some other things we've been doing is just bringing awareness and making uh, 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 new publications on these issues. Back in 2018, we published the Ocean Genomics Horizon Scan, which is a 150 page made by 17 different scientists around the world um, that interviewed more than 100 global scientists to, to confront what are the major issues facing our oceans today and how can biotechnologies help. And from this uh, uh, ocean, this horizon scan, we at, which is available completely online, um, as well as requested for PDF. Um, we actually managed to kickstart our coral toolkit and some of our wild genomes efforts, which I'll describe in a moment. Um, so the first step in the genetic rescue toolkit, that staircase, is basically just sequencing genomes and preserving genetics for the future, uh, biobanks, all these things being prepared, uh, putting tissue away to be prepared for when you might need it in the future, but also just sequencing genomes and making better decisions for conservation, everything from uh, sequencing the genomes of species so that you know uh, where they might be best adapted to move them, where they might be to be protected, where they're breeding, um, to even actually managing to find out natural alleles for disease resistance and breed those. Um, we have over 20 projects now funded with our Wild Genomes program where it's just doing that, just sequencing genomes of, of populations to, uh, to make better conservation decisions. Um, we have one project, uh, two projects actually now that uh, have South American based teams, the Bolivian Jaguar project, which is the first conservation genomics project uh, being completely uh, done within Bolivia, which is going to be sequencing uh, DNA of jaguars to help combat illegal wildlife trade, as well as learn more about where they can move jaguars from one population to another to keep the genetics healthy while the, uh, the habitats are fragmented. And then there are Brazilian teams, part of our five sea turtles project, which will complete all of the genomes of the sea turtles of the world and help make some inf uh, uh, major decisions in Brazil as to how to conserve uh, uh, sea turtles. So these are really amazing projects. Once again, if you get on reviverestore.org, you can find out more about these. The next step in the genetic rescue toolkit is something uh, basically, an application of synthetic alternatives. There's a lot more in this realm that you could do with molecular and cellular tools, but there's a project um, that we have not done ourselves, but are promoting that I think really, uh, really symbolizes the types of things that synthetic biology can do that's outside of the box. Um, and this has to do with the horseshoe crab. So horseshoe crabs, our lineage that goes back 400 million years. Um, they're living fossils that have barely changed over time. And they breed uh, on the eastern coast of the United States. And when they come in giant masses to breed, uh, a lot of species utilize them, but humans collect them and drain them of some blood and throw them back out to sea because their blood is used to test for endotoxins for basically any medicine that goes into your body, any medical device that goes in your body. If it's going inside your body, it's getting tested for endotoxins from bacteria because if, those, if bacteria get inside you, of course that can get really bad really quickly. And so almost pretty much everyone alive today owes their life probably to a horseshoe crab because every vaccine is tested with horseshoe crab blood, which is really significant now with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but the issue here is that, of course, that you can't drain about half an animal's blood and throw it back out to sea and expect it to always live. So thousands upon thousands of horseshoe crabs are bled every year and some of them die and the population has been going down. Um, so this is just a slide about a little bit more 
more about the tests that are, and of course, this includes veterinary medicine, not just human medicine. Um, so the migratory birds that go all the way to South America, make us uh, and migrate back up to the Arctic, they make stops in North America to feed on horseshoe crab decline in horseshoe crabs, there has now been a decline in these birds, which of course, because these birds stay together environments from the Arctic all the way to South America, has repercussions that span almost the, you know, the entire well, Western hemisphere. Um, so we like to save horseshoe crabs. Well, how can we do that? We have to stop the bleeding, but their blood is necessary for medicine. Um, but luckily, back in 1995, a team of biotechnologists managed to isolate the gene in horseshoe crabs that makes the compound that does this endotoxin test. It's something called factor C. And they injected it into a plasmid, I mean, cloned it into a plasmid, put that into E. coli, and created recombinant factor C. And even though this synthetic alternative uses basic synbio and has been around for now more than 25 years, it's been really slow to be adopted by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, Eli Lilly has fully adopted this, um, but companies around the world have not, and governments have not always recognized it as an alternative to horseshoe crab blood. So that's something we're really working hard to promote, and I highly suggest everybody uh, getting on board and lobbying for this transition, because not only is it an awesome use of Synbio, but it's a very simple use of Synbio that can save an, a species and an entire ecosystem. The next step in the genetic rescue toolkit is the use of advanced reproductive technologies. And restoring diversity is a major way to do this. So back in step one, if you're putting away biobanked cells, then later you could bring those animals back. And that's something we've actually done. Um, the world's most famous clone is probably now Elizabeth Ann, uh, the most famous clone since Dolly. We announced the news of her back in February. Uh, she is a cloned black-footed ferret, the first cloned American endangered species, and she was cloned for a very particular purpose. That is me getting to hold her when she was 21 days old. It was absolutely incredible to get to do that um, because it was seven and a half years of work to get to this point, and I'll explain why because I think there's a you know there's a lot to understand about synthetic biology and the fact that uh, it takes a lot of uh, regulatory work to get these things out the door, um, but she's just an incredible, beautiful baby. Um, there is up close, and there she is now at five months old. She's adult size. She'll be uh, sexually mature next spring, and she'll breed. And the reason she's so significant is we cloned her from cells that had been cryopreserved since 1988. She is a genetic twin of a ferret that died 33 years ago who has no living descendants um, it, for her entire species. And the reason that's so significant, sorry, is because black-footed ferrets nearly went extinct in the 80s. In, by 1985, there were only 20 black-footed ferrets left in the world, and they were brought into a captive breeding program uh, to save the species. And they have saved the species, but all 600 black-footed ferrets alive today um, that are alive, and all 10,000 born over the last 25 generations are descended from just seven individuals. And Elizabeth Ann, this clone, is now an eighth member of the gene pool. She's completely unrelated to all of the living individuals, and her genome has three times as much unique allelic variation. So she is going to bring back a lot of unique variation and some adaptability to her species. And as I said, it took seven and a half years to get this project done. We started back in 2013. And the cloning process itself only took two and a half months to go from cells to a live ferret. But it took proposal after proposal, publishing white papers, doing genome se sequencing and science. And all of this was stakeholder engagement, securing partnerships, fundraising, even gaining federal permits to actually start this research. Uh, it was tons of paperwork and annual meetings, but building up that credibility and trust was key to being able to start using this biotech in this program. 
And that little picture in the bottom there are actually the world's first cloned embryos of black-footed ferrets, which were a test phase. And then by 2021, we were ready to go and took the frozen cells, thawed them out, took the egg cells of a domestic ferret, a different species, took away the nucleus, fused those cells to create an embryo, stimulated, put that embryo into a surrogate mom, and 42 days later, Elizabeth Ann was born by C-section. There are other ways that we've been considering restoring genetic diversity. Um, so ways of uh, using modern gene editing. So for species like the Chatham Island black robin, and this is a, a hypothetical, this is not a real project, but this actually is something we plan to do with black-footed ferrets. Um, these species that go through these huge bottlenecks, um, uh, this species went down to just five individuals, including just one last female, which they bred back up 250 living individuals today. Well, there are black robins in museum collections that we could sequence their DNA, find alleles that have been lost, and gene edit those back into the living population to restore diversity. It's not the same as getting entire genomes by cloning an individual from their cells, but getting back things like immune genes um, and significant uh, uh, adaptable and functional alleles is something that we could start uh, doing right now. Now, facilitated adaptation, this is a broad category where, you know, if there's a species that's succumbing to disease or climate change, where we might be able to tweak its genome in just a way to give it uh, a leg up to, to adjust to human-caused factors. Probably the best example of this, and the world's first example, genetic engineering being used to save a species, um, is the American chestnut tree. This is not our work once again. This is work that we promote heavily. Um, but the American chestnut was uh, the most abundant tree in the Appalachian chain in the United States. And then in the late 1800s, a fungal disease from Asia was, was brought here and started killing these trees. They have no immunity to this. It creates these cankers on the trees and they die off. And 99% of all of these trees or more died off. And then 20 years ago, a team found that a single gene from wheat could be integrated into the genome of the chestnut tree and allow it to live with the disease. So it doesn't kill the disease, it actually allows the tree to survive the infection. The team behind this is William Powell's team. That's William to the left and Andy Newhouse up in the right, actually with the genetic tree, genetically engineered trees behind them. They're at the SUN uh, uh, State University of New York. Um, uh, and their work is just incredible, and it's taken them about 20 years to do it, and now they're going through the legal pr work to actually be able to plant these trees in the wild. And so after a century of this tree being completely obliterated, in our lifetime, we will be able to restore this species to its former glory, which is absolutely incredible, and it will be the first time that genetic engineering restores a species. The last thing I want to talk about today is the thing that I actually work on the most, which is de-extinction. Um, so de-extinction is actually what Revive and Restore is known for the best. I work on, I lead the Passenger Pigeon Project. We have Heath Hen and Woolly Mammoth, which is led by the Church Lab in uh, Harvard. I work on passenger pigeons, so that's what I'll tell you all about. But first, what is de-extinction? Well, there are reintroductions. So when a species goes extinct in an area, they can be brought back from somewhere else. So uh, this was done in Yellowstone, very famous case of the wolves in Yellowstone National Park. They were gone for 70 years, and then wolves from another area were brought in to restore their ecological niche. In some cases, species go completely. There's nowhere to grab a living member of them. So there's something called ecological replacement. Um, one of the famous cases of this is on the island of Mauritius, where they had a species of giant tortoise that went extinct, and so they grabbed giant tortoises from the island of Aldabra and brought them to Mauritius, and uh, on the island of uh, Round Island, which is just off the shore of Mauritius, they had incredible ecological restoration with these. 
But what about when there's no living replacement that can do, right? So woolly mammoths lived in the Arctic um, through through glacial and interglacials. You know, they were they were up there in the in the northern climes, surviving warm and hot periods. But ultimately, they were able to survive through the winters. Something that Asian elephants, their nearest relatives, cannot do. Asian elephant and put it in Siberia don't survive. So what do you do? Well, we can see the genomes of those extinct species and use gene editing today to get back some of the functional alleles that will allow a living relative to take on their ecological role. So de-extinction by definition is just a form of ecological replacement in which we actually alter the phenotype of an animal to actually take the role of an extinct species and restore habitats and biodiversity. If it's done, well, there are some projects, uh, one notable project in South Africa where they're trying to recreate the colors of the extinct quagga, a type of zebra. A team noticed that li some living zebras do have some phenotypes that are similar and through several generations of breeding have been getting very close to the original color and pattern of the extinct quagga. They actually have some of their uh, rao quaggas, as they call them, free roaming. Um, but this isn't something that will be possible for most extinct species. Most extinct species don't have similar living animals to breed or living descendants like the extinct aurochs, which is the, the ancestor of all living cattle. There, there have been efforts to try and take cattle and reconstitute uh, their genetic diversity uh, into the original phenotype of the aurochs. Once again, really can't use this very often. In most cases, we will have to use gene editing, where there's just no way to breed a living animal to become like an extinct species, but we will be able to bring back their actual genes. This is what we're doing with the passenger pigeon. If you want to know more about de-extinction, of course, there is the paper I published in 2018. Even though it's a few years old, it is still the most up-to-date treatment on the topic. Um, and I wrote it to try and be really accessible, so definitely check it out. It is open access, free for everybody. So a neat way to think of de to think about what the genome looks like of uh, of a de-extinct organism. And for that, I actually want to talk about the first genetically engineered organism in the world, the red canary. Um, now, this was not done with biotechnology, and that's why a lot of people don't know about it. But genetic engineering is the integration of genes by design. And you can do that through breeding. Um, so back in the 1940s, a team of people decided they wanted to create red canaries. Well, canaries happen to be yellow. so. They took the South American red siskin and hybridized it with the European canary. And it created kind of an orangish bird. And of course, it inherited half of its genome from the yellow canary and half from the red siskin. And those little bars on the side are meant to be cartoon uh, chromosomes. Well, then they started to breed those uh, hybrids back to yellow canaries to get them to be more and more yellow canary and less and less red siskin. And of course, every time they breed, the chromosomes go through recombination, creating these hybrid chromosomes. And they start bre breeding and back breeding the hybrids slowly, trying to whittle away most of the red siskin genes and just keep the red genes. And they actually managed to do it. They got canaries that are red. They have the, the genes from red siskins that create red pigment from their diet. but are virtually uh, uh, yellow canary. And decades later, these hybrids were actually um, the reason people were, actually, were able to discover what gene makes that red pigment. It's really cool to look up. There's a whole book on the red canary and its history. Um, definitely worth the read. But of course, for the passenger pigeon project, we cannot breed a passenger pigeon and a band-tailed pigeon. Passenger pigeons are extinct. But using gene editing, we can basically do the same thing by introducing key alleles into the band-tailed pigeon's genome. So that even though most of its genome is band-tailed pigeon, 
And I should note that these species are 97% identical, so most of the band-tailed pigeon, pigeon's genome is already passenger pigeon genome. But even though it comes from band-tailed pigeons, it will have these key alleles from the passenger pigeon, which should give it the passenger pigeon's phenotypes and ecology. Now, there are natural analogs to this. There are red wolves in the eastern U.S., which have hybrid uh, ancestry to both coyotes and gray wolves, but are a unique species in the environment. Every grizzly bear in North America America happens to have ancestry from polar bears that goes as far back 30,000 years. Um, we don't know um, why these species have hybridized, but we know that it only goes one way. There are no polar bears with grizzly bear genes, but every grizzly living today has polar bear genes. So neat stuff there. And of course, humans any human being that is descent, not uh, descended from the people that came out of Africa and colonized the world, which I'm betting most of you listening are, happen to be hybrids with Neanderthals. We all have somewhere between 1% to 2% Neanderthal ancestry. So even we are very similar to the types of things we're talking about doing for mammoths and passenger pigeons. And so that brings me to the Passenger Pigeon Project and how it will work. These are the five stages of de-extinction and basically how we would do things like facilitated adaptation and other gene editing based approaches where first we sequence the genome of our species, figure out the genes and the, and the mutations that make a difference, and then through gene editing in, in a petri dish basically create cell cultures of those animals that have our extinct species genome, and then insert those into living surrogate mothers and fathers to be able to breed a new generation and through captive breeding, build up numbers and eventually release them to the wild. Now it's those first three steps that are actually brand new where the SynBio comes into account. Those last two steps, captive breeding and, um, and restoring species to the wild, releasing them. That's actually been going on for over a hundred years with great success. Species like the California condor um, have been saved that way. And recently the uh, Alagaus curacao, which was extinct in the wild for decades, has just been reintroduced a few individuals into the wild. So that is a Brazilian species where this has been done. Um, this gets done a lot, actually. Um, so, of course, this timeline is no longer valid because we don't have the funding to keep this up, which I'll talk about. I'm having to answer those questions. Um, but over time, the idea is we'll take the band-tailed pigeon and make it like a passenger pigeon. Now, theoretically, we could do this in a single generation. However, it may take some iterations. We don't understand how all these genes work. So we may put in some genes and get a bird that ends up looking partway in between. So then we need to add more and more. I'm hoping to actually get it done in a single generation. And how we'll do that, of course, is we'll take a living band-tailed pigeon, we'll isolate something called their primordial germ cells. Um, this is key because in birds, we can't actually do cloning the way we did at the black-footed ferret. We have to use these primordial germ cells to do the gene editing, and these cells will become sperm and eggs in the adults. And once we have primordial germ cells that have passenger pigeon mutations, we can take those and implant those into a developing embryo, um, like, a, like a regular domestic pigeon. And as the cells colonize the gonads, those donor cells of ours will colonize as well. And so we'll have a bird that we incubate, hatch, raise to maturity. And when it grows up, it will look like a completely normal bird but inside of its testes and ovaries, it will have the germ cells that we edited. And so if you take female and a male version of this, this surrogate mother and father, and breed them, they will lay eggs that hatch out a de-extinct passenger pigeon. And that is the basic process in a nutshell. After that comes the whole breeding and captivity and restoration wild, which of course is the goal. So this comes to why we would care to do this. Well, passenger pigeons, Pigeons in the United States, historically, the most abundant bird on the planet, um, in the United States and the planet. There were five billion of them in the late 1800s, I mean, in the early 1800s, and 
what they would do is they would flock in flocks of a billion, come into an area of forest, overcrowd branches, break over trees, deposit just literally tons of guano. And while that seems like absolute disaster, it would spur regenerative processes in the forest, um, bringing in new life, allowing sunlight into the forest floor, new growth. And that process is key to keeping up biodiversity in Eastern American forests. And by doing that at that scale, it was an ecosystem engine. So this is the life cycle of the passive pigeon. So basically, a flock would come into an area of forest, start the regeneration cycle, and because they were moving to a new patch of forest every few weeks, they were keeping the entire eastern seaboard forests in constant flux. While they came into an area and deposited all that guano, that guano became a huge resource for insects, which were then preyed on by predatory insects and insectivores and, and hunters and, sca and scavengers eating the birds and those animals. I mean, literally these types of things create hot spots. We know this because of research of uh, colonial nesting birds in Australia that shows that wherever these giant guano deposits happen, you create hot spots of bioabundance. And of course, when the birds leave, the regeneration process starts having new growth come in, bringing in a complete new succession of species. And as that forest continues to mature, you get different species using the same patch of ground. So over time, one patch of forest and much more life than it would if it was just one type of habitat. And if you've got this happening in a patchwork, then these species can continue to move around to their ideal habitat type um, and be sustained on a large scale. Since the extinction of the passenger pigeon, those early successional habitats in the East United States have virtually gone extinct as well. And so our idea is by getting back the pigeons, we can restore those habitat types and prevent a whole host of species from going extinct as well, because hundreds of plants and animals today, despite having lots of forest, are declining due to this lack of dynamic regeneration. And as I said, de-extinction is not really a new concept. People have been restoring species all over, like the wolves in Yellowstone and the, and even beaver in Britain sometimes have been, have been gone for decades to centuries to millennia. This is why we do this. So this is a neat little infographic from around the world. Um, and this is actually happening in South America too. A really amazing project is the Ibera rewilding project happening down um, in Northern Argentina and the Southern border of Brazil where five different species have been reintroduced in the past uh, couple decades, or I think just the past decade, including jaguars and ant giant anteaters. People think these big animals that have been gone from a region for decades and restoring them for a whole host of reasons, for economic stimulation, uh, for improving the biomechanics of, of carbon sequestration or, or you know, filtering pollutants, increasing biodiversity, saving species, you name it. This is why people bring back species that have been gone or try to replace them. And sometimes these species have been gone an incredible long time. In Pleistocene Park in Siberia, the species that have been brought back there have been gone for 7,000 years. And the most recent one in 2017 in Spain, bison were reintroduced despite having been gone for 15,000 years. So de-extinction is happening but now with gene editing, we can extend it to species like mammoths and passenger pigeons, which have been gone and have no living relatives that could do the job. So we view the future like this. We have a, we have a present in which we have lost biodiversity and bioabundance, but by applying biotechnology and making changes to how we make food, energy, our economic structure, if we change how we live on this planet and use biotechnology strategically, we can have a biodiverse future. And with that, I am happy to take questions and apologize for being so brisk, but I definitely wanted to get everything in. Well, thank you so much, Ben. It was a pleasure to have you here and talk about this amazing projects that you have going on in the lab. 
And as you can see, we got a lot of people so excited about your presentation in the chat. It's really not something that we see that that we see a lot when it comes to talking about conservation in Brazil. So you can see the comments showing up in the screen. People were really mind blown by <laughs> all the possibilities. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, there really is no shortage of, of possibilities yeah. in using gene editing and, and, and biotech for conservation. Something I didn't talk about uh, uh, that I'll share, of course, is um, you know, I think the, the horseshoe crab is a great example of, of a way where something in the medical industry could end up saving something in nature. And there's a, a whole bunch we use um, from nature and ways that we interact with nature where I've talked mostly about species in the wild, but changes to agricultural crops and livestock um, are always how we could help save nature as well. Um, like livestock tend to spread disease to wild animals. So if we can make more disease resistant livestock, we can help stop spreading disease to wildlife. So, so agriculture, medicine, even if you're not, you know, pursuing a career or an education in, in, uh, nature conservation, you can still do things in those fields that have huge, huge impacts to conservation. So just wanted to put that out there too. That is indeed very uh, important to concentrate on. I personally didn't know about the horseshoe crab uh, blood draining issue until I saw it on your website. I don't believe I had I've told you that, but I'm your biggest fan around. <laughs> 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 I'm a personal huge fan of all your work. I fell in love with the first time, the fir since the first time I saw you talking about the extension. And <laughs> oh my goodness, that's that video is so old now. <laughs> oh man, but it's still <laughs> it was gold. It was a bad hair day. It's a bad oh, hair man, day, it's but just pure gold. <laughs> but a lot of what we talked, what I talked about back in that video is, you know, still holds true. So, so in 2013, I gave a TEDx de-extinction talk in which a whole bunch of scientists gave talks, including the chestnut uh, scientists, people from the frozen zoo, the California condor program. There's tons of great talks from that event. Um, and the project is still basically the same concept. One of the reasons, you know, we said that it we would do it in 10 years and we can totally do it in 10 years with the technology development we need but an issue of course has been sustained funding so for the passenger pigeon project we need something in the ballpark of about 25 million dollars to actually recreate passenger pigeons which we could do in like seven to ten years uh if we had 25 million dollars so if so if 250,000 people just donated ten dollars I could give you passenger pigeons in about seven years um, and create the technologies that would actually allow us to do things like make Hawaiian birds resistant to malaria, um, help restore diversity to birds around the world. I mean, we need to actually break through that primordial germ cell technology I talked about for birds. It only works right now in the domestic chicken. Um, it's a little difficult to get it to work on other birds. And so we need to expand that out. And we actually do have projects that are just starting to work on this with other species, but we really need to, uh, you know, get those off the ground and literally give them wings, um, pun intended. Uh, and, you know, so, so making that technology work in pigeons and parrots, in seabirds and passerines is something that will unlock genetic rescue for all birds, but also finally allow us to get our um, passenger pigeon project off the ground because we've actually gotten a little bit of science at every step of the way we've done ecological work um, I'm actually giving a webinar tomorrow um, that anyone can can attend here I'll actually I'll grab the link for everybody and, and share it please, um, please do. because I'll be giving a talk on the passenger pigeons ecology and 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 uh, natural history and what it means for forests it's gonna be a pivotal moment for the project because it's the first time I'm getting to engage with stakeholders in the forestry realm. And so I'll be sharing unpublished data and all the research that we've been doing for the years. It won't be biotech heavy, it'll be, it'll be natural history heavy. Um, but, uh, 
basically those five stages we've done the genomes we've we've done some some test breeding work we've actually done the first work with band tail pigeons from south america actually um on breeding we've got a little bit of knowledge at every step of the way and i did some work with pigeons in australia where we actually successfully for the first time created the ability to hatch uh, manipulated pigeons. Uh, we did not get the world's first genetically engineered pigeon, but we did get um, the process done. So we've got everything we need, but we need that one vital piece to complete the puzzle, and then we'll be able to really take off. Um, but I will stop talking and allow <laughs> some people to ask some questions. And while I listen to a question, I will quickly grab um, a link to to the talk tomorrow because everybody can register and if you can't tune in live as long as you register for the event you'll be able to see the recording once it goes online but if you don't register you won't be able to see it well i'm pretty sure a lot of people will register right now then me included so jumping on to the first question considering your 2018 paper on crispr and conservation as well as your other projects which are the biggest biotech king cards to help mitigate climate change? To help mitigate climate change. Um, well, of course, the, the Woolly Mammoth Project is meant to, um, here, I'm sharing the link now in the private chat. I don't know how to get it to everybody else oh, um, uh, we can because I'm it. useless. Um, so climate change is something that uh, definitely requires uh, uh, industrial technology to confront quickly. There's going to be no biological um, solution to it that happens quickly enough because right now, you know, there is no way to sound the alarm too much. Right now, um, so in in the the permafrost of the north is locked away anywhere from 10,000 to a million years of permafrost, which basically for the Pleistocene, the grassland that once covered the tundra and half the taiga where the mammoths lived, those grasses were building on top of each other over time, sequestering carbon in their root systems, creating soil. And because it was always frozen, it's locked away. There are so many megatons of carbon up there that if the permafrost melts, it would be like burning all of the world's forests 10 times. It will be absolutely climate catastrophic if the permafrost melts completely. And it's melting right now. Just two years ago, Sergey Zimov's team who monitors uh, permafrost temperature in, in Siberia uh, recorded the first time ever that a permafrost layer did not refreeze during the winter which is a huge, huge issue. It's a, it's a, it should be a turning point for the world because in the last 30 years, the permafrost has risen three degrees Celsius. And if it raises three degrees more, it all melts. So we're three degrees away from global catastrophe. So we need to do something major to alter, to get carbon out of the atmosphere and alter these things. But if we don't insulate the permafrost, we won't save it. Um, and the way to do that is through restoring grasses on top of it. And Sergey Zimov has been doing that by returning large herbivores. Now, the main thing is that this is Russia's problem for the world, right? Russia has the most land to, to make a dent and Canada. Canada and Russia have to step up to the plate and, and, and do this and turn all of that tundra into grassland. And you can do it by bringing in bison, yaks, you know, deer, just large herds of grazing animals we want to bring back mammoths because they play a key role in that ecosystem as super megafauna like no other species does. Um, and while it will take possibly decades to centuries to actually restore that entire ecosystem, once it is restored, that ecosystem will create a climate buffer that could last us for millions of years because it was a climate buffer for two million years. Even though the world was getting hot and cold, hot and cold, that environment was largely stable and was a major reason why we weren't getting huge influxes of carbon every time the world got warm. So, so the mammoth is, is the major uh, climate change project. And a quick question. Do you think Canada and Russia are stepping onto the plate 
with the same no. urgence that they should be? <laughs> no, I do not. I actually think problematically that Canada is actually seeing the ability to economically exploit global warming because they're able to get natural resources now from areas where they couldn't before. Um, so Canada, I think right now is actually making the problem worse. Uh, I don't think Russia has any, any, uh, uh, any set goals of doing anything for the climate. I mean, these are countries that are part of the Paris Agreement. Um, so, you know, politically, uh, they've, they've stamped on to do something about climate, but they are the most crucial countries for doing something for climate change. And I've, uh, I personally have not heard much from those countries uh, of them making an effort. Mm. Well, that's, that's a pity and a problem for all of us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's just hope that they eventually step up. <laughs> so, on to the next question. What are the main differences, genetically speaking, when approaching a de-extinction project for a mammal, aka, let's say, for example, the woolly mammoth, and avians, like the passenger pigeon? Like, if you could say, uh, when you're going to approach a de-extinction project on an avian and on a mammal, what are the larger difference, genetic differences that you have to make? Yeah. So this is actually um, the part of the work where we need more discovery. So we actually need more. So uh, these genomes are out there in the world for people to check out. Um, I would actually love it if we could organize something like a hackathon for people to look at these genomes and, and look at it with the eyes of an engineer. Um, because we've done some selection scans in our, in our uh, studies. The, the thing is, is that we compare genomes and we try to look for areas under positive selection um, and look at the alleles there. We don't know what most genes do. You know, of, of the 20,000 genes in a, in a vertebrate's body, uh, uh, you know, um, we know what a few of them do. Um, we know a few pathways they're involved in, but we don't know what most genes do. We don't know what most of their regulatory elements do and how they work. But we can at least analyze genomes and find the regions under positive selection and make some inferences that they're important. There are 25 million mutations that separate a passenger pigeon and a band-tailed pigeon. We do not have the ability right now to make 25 million changes in a genome. We could make hundreds to thousands of changes. So if we zoom in on, on the changes that actually affect traits that versus being neutral, what we're looking for in the passenger pigeon are things that uh, influence social behavior, so neurology. Um, we're looking for things that influence the uh, uh, growth of those species. Um, they they had extremely rapid growth, which is key for their ecology, and things that um, made the males different color than the females. Sexual dimorphism in that species is critical to uh, uh, reinforcing social behavior, as well as the shape of the tail. So. Basically, sexual dimorphic color, tail shape, growth, and behavior are what we care for in the passenger pigeon. That could be dozens of genes that matter, dozen, do, a few dozen regions, or it could be thousands. We don't really know. We know that there's at least 25 million mutations to choose from. We want to get down to like maybe the 1% or less that really make a change. Um, in the mammoth, there's only about a million mutations between it and an Asian elephant. They're very similar species. They're so similar, in fact, that uh, when I worked at a laboratory in Canada, we sequenced DNA from a, a mammoth bone and a mastodon bone, um, and they turned out to be Asian elephants. <laughs> Whoa. Um, so they looked like fossils. They were dug up from the ground. But back in the 1800s, when circuses were traveling on the train, if one of their elephants died, they would just dump it and bury it wherever they were. So are the, there are these old circus elephants and zoo elephants from the 1800s that are buried. And when you dig them up, they look like fossils. And elephants and mastodons and mammoths are so similar that you can barely tell the difference. The key thing in mammoths is things like their hemoglobin, their sodium ion channels, um, the, the subcutaneous fat, and of course their wool. So their hair growth, their fat their blood. Those are the key traits. George Church's lab has already edited about 42-ish uh, alleles in the genome that are, that are involved in those traits. We actually know a lot more about mammals, so that's actually going to be easier with that. Um, and, you know, in theory, they've already got a mammoth in a petri dish, but um, getting it to become a live animal is going to be something really difficult because a, um, a mammoth pregnancy is two years. So, um, but I do want to clarify that 
Asian elephants and mammoths are the same size. So there's there's no issue with the surrogate parenting there. And they're also so behaviorally, uh, we assume they're so behaviorally uh, similar because of the fossil assemblages we have from mammoths that the world's first baby mammoth is not alone. He's born into a family of elephants and there happen to be elephants in zoos in Canada that uh, play in the snow. Asian elephants can actually endure cold temperatures. Um, you know, you can think of back in the time of Hannibal when he marched them over the Pyrenees to attack the Romans. Asian elephants can live in winter conditions. They just can't survive them that long. Um, so, so Asian elephants are getting, you know, they're very close to uh, mammoths. We just need to get them a nudge of the way there. Wow, that's crazy. I never thought that, much that it would be <laughs> messenger pigeons. I, my main issue with that would be that the, the whole behavioral, behavioral part of the woolly mammoth would be the biggest challenge since they are social animals, but apparently that's not that big of a problem. That's crazy. You know, the, the history of conservation, um, a lot of species that are worked with are in captivity are social. Um, and it, it's been shown with birds especially that you can puppet raise birds and they'll grow up and, and be completely behaviorally indistinguishable from wild-born individuals. Um, that's been found with eagles and peregrine falcons and other birds of prey. Um, you know, it just takes, it takes innovation. You need to, to know what you're doing a little bit, observe other species. Birds have also been raised by other species and with different behaviors and still end up doing really well in the wild. Um, here, I'll snag a couple questions from the side here because I like these. Uh, I see them, something about parasites and another plethora of organisms. So we get a lot of questions with extinct species about like their microbiomes, their, their, their parasites, et cetera. And here's what I will say. For most extinct species, we have no idea what their microbiota was simply because we don't have preserved uh, fecal samples or guts to be able to analyze. For some we do, that actually has been looked at for, for mammoths. Um, but the thing is about microbiota and even parasites, one, parasites, it's nice to just not even worry about. Even though parasites are a nice check for keeping some, you know, whittling out old or weak or etc like there are plenty of parasites that will invade species so we don't need to bring back parasites to really to really have success here you know species that have been reintroduced from other areas um and replacements haven't had any issues with parasites with the microbiota once again we are using a living species to recreate an extinct one. So the living species microbiome is what will work. And microbiomes are plastic. So even though they definitely have major epigenetic influences on individuals that can transcend generations, they are very plastic. Once you introduce species into a new area, their diet and their environment will start to reshape their microbiome. Um, as long as they're healthy and doing well when you put them in an environment, they will usually adapt. Um, it is difficult, you know, most translocations, about 50% of translocations fail. These can be due to releasing animals at the wrong time of year, not releasing a large enough group or releasing too large of a group, um, not releasing the right sex ratio. Um, so people have started to learn a lot on how we can make that improved. But one of the biggest ways that people are improving reintroductions and rewilding is actually just looking at genetics, looking at the genes and going, what is the allelic makeup that might work really well in this habitat? And it turns out that the genetics of a background population are probably one of the largest influencing factors of failure. So with our de-extinction projects, we might end up having really great success. So, so that gives me hope there. That's so true. I cannot imagine how much work would be involved if we had to have, uh, apart from restoring the animal itself, also having to worry about the microbiome. <laughs> so for the next question, it's from Yala Sampaio. So mammoths are Asian elephants. <laughs> Asian, are Asian elephants live in fossils? <laughs> well, well, kind of. So Asian elephants and mammoths, uh, uh, um, diverged from each other about five to six million years ago. Um, and in general, the different species have actually hybridized a lot. And I think the, the proboscidean lineage, elephants, are actually a really great example of, of how much we've lost 
in the world. So a lot of times we talk about the sixth mass extinction and you'll see headlines that say things like, are we in at the start of a sixth mass extinction? Is the sixth mass extinction happening? And I actually, my background is ecology and evolution and paleontology. There have been five mass, ex sorry, five mass extinctions in history like that that killed the dinosaurs. And these are not events that happen quickly. They, they take tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. And in geological time, that's a blink of an eye. But it's what makes things confusing right now because everybody looks at just the past 500 years when in fact human beings have been causing extinctions for the last 125,000 years, possibly 300,000 years, as long as we've existed. Um, human beings have eradicated most super megafauna on the planet. And the elephant group is a great example. In the late Pleistocene, 10 to 20,000 years ago, there were 17 species of proboscidean that lived on every continent except Australia and, and Antarctica and lived on a lot of islands. You know, South America had the Gomphotheres, North America had mammoths and, uh, and, and Eurasia. They were just covered in different species. There were even uh, uh, dwarf species from different habitats, uh, I mean, different islands. And today there are only three, and that is heavily influenced by humans. Um, so please ask another question. I need to figure out <laughs> how to plug in my laptop before it dies. Sure thing. Uh, so for the next question, uh, we're fetching it right now, is from João. What, what are the ethical challenges in Do making... Uh, I need to find an outlet quick before it dies. Ah, uh, okay. I was waiting quickly. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought <laughs> I was on mute. <laughs> There we go. Reach. I'll have to move here a little bit. There we go. All right. Please ask the question again because I was being too loud. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. It was super fine. Uh, what are the ethical challenges in making genetic enhancement on endangered species, even if that means giving them a better chance to survive long term wise? Yeah, so actually at the moment, uh, Revive and Restore is embarking on, on work to try and develop a, a code of practice um, basically, and principles to kind of guide and look into the ethics of this because this comes into everything, not just for the animals themselves, but you know, this type of conservation has repercussions to everything from social inequality to you know, racial inequity in history. You know, conservation does have um uh, uh systemic racism in its in its problems and its history and there's worries about how biotech especially you know rich people with biotech might end up coming in and using this technology for so there's a lot of things to consider most people that i've talked about today the people doing the chestnut work the horseshoe crab work like these people all want the best things for the world right they have they have saving the world in their in their hearts um for the animals involved themselves there are standards of animal welfare um, and different practices that at least in the US and Australia and many European countries are in existence and there's regulatory pathways to go through. So, you know, there's mainly we want to ensure that these animals have a high quality of life, even if they're having to spend their entire lives in captivity and that, um, you know, we can provide uh, uh, justification for any tests and things that we go along the way. In the environment, what's different about these than, say, GMO crops, of course, is that we want our genetic changes to actually spread and thrive. So, you know, one of the natural questions is, could the gene you put into a black-footed ferret or a chestnut tree jump into other species? And while horizontal gene transfer is something that happens, um, the likelihood of an integrated gene jumping is the same as that of any other gene in a genome. Therefore, it's an extremely low probability of a specific gene jumping. And as long as we're working with um, gene constructs from nature that already exist and are probably being swapped around, we're not really going to be doing anything that causes damage, um, which, is, which is really good to know. But there's a whole host of risk assessments for species reintroductions or, or biocontrol releases and things that exist that are very translatable to the types of genetic changes we're talking about making.
So um, I didn't get to talk a lot about invasive species, but new gene drive technologies could be incredibly humane as well as safe, uh, much safer than the things we do today. And there's already a host of workshops and global consortiums thinking about the ethics and, uh, and actually some colleagues of ours that have already published their own principles. So there's, there's a lot of self-policing going on while the government catches up. But uh, a lot of regulation that already exists could be adapted as well. So I think, I think the, the future is very bright for this and hopefully we can make it one that everybody can be involved with um, so that everybody can confront these ethical challenges and contribute rather than just a small group of people. Oh, that that's great. It's always important to look on the ethical part of the on the conservation debate because that is usually one of the main stakeholders when you are going to do it in the with the biotechnology and genetic approach. People are always very scared of what you can do with genetic modification. So to have it on mind before you do anything, it's very important. So this one is from Giovanna, and she wants to know, Ben, what is the threshold of putting extinct species in a certain location through the extinction, and it becomes an invasive species? What would be the protocols in this case? All right, so, um, you know, I mentioned that uh, we, uh, you know, there are, there are, uh, there's a host of assessment and protocols for, for judging this. Um, so in my de-extinction paper, I confronted this question. I mean, really, it's not an issue of time. It's an issue of the environment in its present state. Um, because, in, because ecosystems go through fluctuations, and while they're not always the, never the same, even between th tens of thousands of years, they can reach very similar states. Um, so in Spain, as I said, the, the oldest reintroduction I'm aware of is in Spain, where bison were released in, uh, well, European bison, known as Wissant, um, were released in Spain, and they've been gone from Spain for about 15,000 years. So you can go back way far and bring a species back into an environment. And at that point, you're not really bringing it back. You're you know, bringing it in. It's, it's something new almost. But in almost every case of doing this, species have not become invasive. When they're being returned to environments that still have members of the community that co-evolved, that's a key part to say there is, is if there's co-evolved community, then you can really do this well without be anything becoming invasive. Recently, there was a damaging trend. from Yala Sampayo, and she wants to know, uh, of one of the main challenges in preserving endangered species is to deal with a large endogamy ratio. What could we do to induce genetic uh, diversity in populations like this? which stage would we do it? Would we do it during the embryo stage? Would we do it in the uh, parents' gonads? You mentioned something uh, regarding that on your slide presentation. Apart from that, is there any other ways to induce genetic, genetic diversity? Because we have a, an issue here in Brazil with the Spix Macau. You know the bird, bird from Rio? Yes, yes. yes. Um... Yeah, yeah, I'm very familiar with that story. Um, it's it's nice to see some of the private owners of those birds working with people to actually help them out, but uh, it's got a long road ahead. So, you know, there are populations, particularly of birds, that have gotten down to less than 10 individuals and have been saved. But, of course, their gene pools are so small that that it is difficult to to kind of keep them going indefinitely. Um, for preservation for the future, right now with birds, because we don't have the right technologies to really utilize cell types, um, with birds it's challenging because you can't freeze an oocyte. So if anybody had eggs for breakfast this morning, when you crack open a bird egg, the entire yolk is a single egg cell. It's one membrane. They're the largest cells in the world, and you can't cryopreserve that in a way that works. Um, it's also difficult to get a bird to grow from in vitro fertilization. So even if you have sperm and eggs, even though you could, let's imagine you could cryopreserve egg cells, it's extremely difficult to do in vitro and get it to grow because the way birds reproduce, 
and make eggs, um, you can put them in an artificial eggshell, but only like one in 700 birds will grow from in vitro fertilization, so it's extremely difficult. Um, but preserving those primordial germ cells is difficult because they're difficult to culture. So we're hoping to crack that egg, pun intended, but, uh, but we're not there yet. Probably the best thing to do right now for the future, for every species, is to preserve fibroblast cells. Fibroblast cells are easy to culture. You can get them from feathers, skin samples. You can get them without killing animals. That's the thing. So like from a mammal, you can take an ear punch or a skin biopsy and you can culture those. And people should be culturing, you know, and making several million primary cell lines. And you should be getting them from as many diverse individuals as possible. You can, you can repopulate a species from as few as 10 or 12 individuals if they're all genetically diverse and unrelated. But you have to know that ahead of time. You have to know which ones to grab. So getting as many samples of a species as possible, even if the technology doesn't exist to use those yet, is best. To prepare for technologies that already exist, of course, semen cryopreservation is the easiest. Artificial insemination and in vitro fertilization are the easiest technologies to use. So sperm cells are the easiest to get and, and freeze down. So sperm, oocytes if you can get them, but fibroblast cell cultures are, the, are the, the thing to get because in the long run, people will be able to take fibroblast cells, reprogram them into stem cells, make induced pluripotent stem cells, and then use those to make sperm and egg and do things like in vitro fertilization or make those into primordial germ cells that can be implanted into birds. Those cells will be able to reconstitute living species in the future. And so even though the technology doesn't exist now, it is coming. Um, it, it has worked in mice. So there have been mice born from skin cells using stem cells. So they took skin cells, made stem cells, and made sperm and eggs and made in vitro fertilized mice. And right now the San Diego Zoo is actually working on a project to save the northern white rhinoceros doing this, um, which will be one of the first projects that uses it beyond mice. Um, but it's also, you know, it could be possible to do in amphibians, birds, etc. But at least with, amphib with uh, mammals, some insects, and fish, we can use nuclear transfer cloning. So fibroblasts can be used again. And you can use a different species egg cell for that, which is nice. But uh, um, fibroblasts are probably the best thing to be getting. Cell culture fibroblasts. And if that's difficult in the field to sample a bird or a mammal or a fish or something and get it back to a lab. So the next backup is just take a skin sample or a tissue sample and cryopreserve it. Um, if you can get large chunks um, and cryopreserve them, eventually, the, uh, in, and mince them up and do that, um, there are protocols for this, um, then in the future you can unthaw those and make a cell line. Cell line first is the best, but if you can't, just get the tissue cryopreserved. Okay, and... Uh... Refresh my memory. That's what you're doing with the hand project, aren't you? Because on the hand project, you were going through with the fibroblast cryopreservation, and then you convert them into stem cells. Uh, so, so we're not doing the stem cell approach with the heath hens. We are trying to do primary culture of the the germ cells. Um, uh, so we would, l we would love to get to the stem cell route eventually. And of course, as I said, like if we got a large donation of several million dollars to start this, we would be doing both primordial germ cell culture techniques, as well as developing stem cell technologies for birds in parallel. Um, stem cell technologies might not work for all birds due to some quirky things in their, in their, uh, chromosome counts and their genes, but, uh, for, for, at least 40% of birds, it could work. So we definitely need to do multiple approaches there, but primordial germ cells um, can be obtained from embryos or possibly even the gonads of adults. Um, so cryopreserving gonads, if it's possible, can preserve some of those. Even So even though we can't culture them now, it may be possible to freeze them down for culture later. There is a culture media that works for keeping germ cells alive for at least two to three weeks. It will not proliferate the cells, but it will allow people to maybe take samples of rare birds and at least 
somewhat select for the germ cells and then freeze away a small portion. And once culture conditions are developed, those could be thawed out and possibly proliferated. So it's, it's a little difficult to work with the limitations right now, but, uh, but you know, just basically biobanking as much cellular material as possible that are somatic cells, not just the gametes, right? Because sperm is great, but if your whole species goes extinct and all you have are sperm, it's very difficult to think of getting it back because you have to have an egg cell um, and you can only produce a hybrid. So having eggs and sperm is key. Having somatic cells gives you a whole content of DNA. So that is the best. And we are actually definitely promoting biobanking. All of our G wild genomes projects uh, have to biobank for their projects. Um, but I think we're losing species so quickly and, and things are changing so drastically that even though we need to do everything we can through every measure, not just biotech, through every measure to save species that we have, the, tr the, the fact is, is that the future is going to rely heavily on restoration because of what we've already lost and what we will continue to lose while we're trying to fight to save things and change how we do things. So we definitely need, every country needs to have national biobanks. And if people can get these started even at private levels, get biobanks started to save everything and do it re in with redundancy, right? If you put all your biobank in one place and a fire comes through or an earthquake, then you lose everything. So redundancy, backups, and national global efforts of biobanking is so crucial right now. That is so true. <laughs> I, wish, I wish we could start working on project, project yeah. tests right now. <laughs> And you know, the work we've done with the black-footed ferret is the proof in point that you can freeze cells away and decades later use them to bring back a valuable individual to help save a species. We've actually done it twice now. The first time we did it was with an endangered Chevalsky's horse, a species native to uh, Asia, and we've also done it with the black-footed ferret. These are the first times in history that anyone has reached back in time into a frozen zoo biobank and brought individuals back for the genetic rescue of species and so it proves it's it can be done and you can you know put it on ice for decades and so definitely right now we don't have a lot of stuff from the past right now it was done mostly opportunistically so right now is the time to get out and strategically build up those biobanks well that is true i wish we, um i'm looking forward to when we'll build a brazilian biobank hopefully it will be soon enough so maybe we can share some data so I think that is all for today's presentation. Uh, we got a lot of people <laughs> Thank you from your, for your work. And uh, we can only thank you enough for your, for your work, Ben. It's yeah. truly inspirational. So I'll just sign off with saying, of course, that anyone can donate to our work. You go to reviverestore.org and you can donate online and uh, do, uh, do you guys get Amazon uh, in in Brazil? Has it reached your country yet? Amazon oh. shopping? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got Amazon here. So there is a way that you can actually donate to Revive and Restore without spending any of your own money. You go to Smile Amazon, or sorry, it's Amazon Smile. It's smile.amazon.com. And if you sign in through that link, you can choose a charity to donate money to. Um, and you can search Revive and Restore. We are a registered charity with Amazon Smile. Now you always have to make your purchases through Amazon Smile after that point, otherwise it won't work. But on eligible purchases, 0.5% of the profits will go to Revive and Restore. So all that stuff people are ordering through the pandemic or continue to order, you could end up putting some of Amazon's profits into biotech conservation instead. And so definitely pursue that route, smile.amazon.com, register with Revive Restore for the charity, and do all your shopping through that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to put the link on, we're going to share the link for the donations on our social media uh, after this presentation. And thank you so much, Ben, for attending this event today. We're looking forward to chatting in the future, maybe bring back some, uh, some of the extinct species back. Looking forward to it. <laughs> and I think that is 
all. So uh, thank you all very much for attending this talk with Ben Novak. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as we did at Symbio Brazil. And we see you all on Saturday for the continuation of our schedule. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ben. And I'll, we'll see you next time. É isso, gente.